Hello and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle. Thanks for joining us today. And of course, as always, in the studio with me is Jared. He's behind the board there with his headphones on, and he's got his American flag coffee cup, so he is ready to go. Now, my coffee cup says Black Hills Ammunition on it. I love my friends up in Black Hills. Uh, And even though they don't sponsor the show, I love them anyway. (laughs) <laughs> now, uh, since we last uh, since we last met a week ago, there's been a lot of developments, a lot of updates on previous stories, and we're going to get to those today. But we want before we get started, what do we need to do? We need to take care of a little bit of housekeeping. So, number one, thank you to Firearms Radio Network for bringing us on board their network and being our bandwidth sponsor today. We also want to thank Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri, and Caltech Firearms of Cocoa, Florida. Now. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to introduce you guys to a brand new program that we're going to do for Student of the Gun Radio. Now, if you've been following us, you should know that we have a dedicated Student of the Gun Facebook page. It's that easy. Just type in Student of the Gun on Facebook. It'll take you there. And we also have an at Student of the Gun Twitter account. Now, what we would like to do and and what I've decided is we're going to do a, a Student of the Week or a Question of the Week. And uh, what we want you guys to do out there is go to our Facebook account, go to like us on Facebook, and send us a question. If you've got a question for me, uh, or if you have a, a general firearms question that you're curious about, post it. And if we pick your question to be read on the air, you will be the student of the week. Now, what do you get? Well, besides my hearty congratulations, we'll also send you an official student of the gun t-shirt. That's right. So go to Facebook, go to studentofthegun.com, like us. And if you've got a question for me, go ahead and post it up there. And if we pick your question to be read on the air, not only uh, will you get the accolades from all of your peers and they'll slap you on the back for being such a cool guy or girl, uh, we will send you an official student of the gun t-shirt. So that's, we've got that going. So remember student of the week, and that's the new program. Now, what are we going to talk about this week? Oh my Lord. I don't want to bring you guys down, but (laughs) I cannot ignore this story, the story out of New York City. And you're like, oh, Lord, Paul, you want to talk about New York again? Well, they keep doing stupid things, so I'm going to have to keep talking about them. When they stop doing stupid things in New York, then guess what? I'll stop talking about them. Well, this one, I've actually, my my source for this is... uh, it's John, Dr. John Lott, and if you know anything about John Lott, uh, he, he is a very famous author, and he's a professor. He's a Ph.D., and on John Lott's website, it says, uh, New York City millionaire faces three years in jail for using an unlicensed gun on a burglar in his home. And for those of you who haven't heard about this story, you might be thinking, wow, did, did he kill this guy? Someone come in his house, and he said, bang, I got you, and, and, and killed him? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, it seems that uh, this gentleman... Uh, what's what's the gentleman's name? Make sure I get it right here. As his name was Mr. Bardwell, age 60. He was at home in his uh, New York City apartment. Someone broke into his home, and he confronted them with a pistol. Well, the burglar decided, hmm, he was a level one, and he didn't want to be shot, so he fled. Well, like a good citizen, uh, Mr. Bardwell contact called the police called him and said hey guy broke in i confronted him with a gun he fled and here's the surveillance camera footage of the incident go find the bad guy you know what they did instead they arrested the homeowner that's right they arrested the homeowner for suspicion of owning an illegal firearm that's right now uh, when they all shook out it turned out that the gun was legally registered to the defendant's bodyguard so it was not an illegal gun, as uh, Mayor Bloomberg likes to say. Uh, we're more worried about illegal animate objects than illegal people, I guess, or, or unlawful people. But, uh, yeah, he's been charged. And uh, according to the district attorney's office, they said that, well, they do understand that it was a self-defense case. However, that gun in his hand wasn't registered and licensed to him. Now, folks, what do you think about that out there? Jared, what do you think? You think that's a good idea? Jared's giving me the, he's shaking his head. He's got a look of disgust on his face. If I were to tell you that this case happened in England, you would probably believe it because they're lunatics over there. They actually charge homeowners for defending themselves against burglars. But this is happening in the United States of America. 
And for all of you reasonable people out there who, uh, you know, go to sleep at night thinking, well, you know, I know that happens in other parts of the world, but that won't happen here in America. Certainly it won't happen. Uh, or, or I got one for you. Well, that ha might happen in New York, but that would never happen in my hometown. What is Mayor Bloomberg doing right now? Well, Mayor Bloomberg is spending millions upon millions of dollars on a propaganda campaign nationwide to try and convince you, the American citizen, that you don't need guns. You just need police protection. You need the government to protect you. Well, can the government protect you? Uh, is there a Look out in your driveway right now. I'll, I'll wait for you. Okay. Is there a police car parked in your driveway? You, there is? Well, you better go find out what he wants. Uh, most of you probably don't have a police car sitting in your driveway protecting your home and your family from uh, unknown burglars, do you? Well, I was a cop, and as you know, and the police department does not have a duty to protect you as an individual. They have a duty to protect you as a whole, to protect the community as a whole, but not as an individual. Be think about it like this. If the government, if the local police or sheriff's department had a specific duty to protect you as an individual and you were harmed, you were robbed, you were raped, you were murdered, well, if you're murdered, your family can sue them. If any harm befell you, then could you not legitimately seek redress by going and suing the police department saying, you failed in your charge, you failed in your duty to protect me? Well, that's actually been tried before, and it's been found by the course that the police department does not have a duty to protect you as an individual, only the community as a whole. So in other words tough noogies for you, brother. You have to defend yourself. And if you talk to an honest cop, to a cop who will really give you the straight scoop, he'll tell you, look, brother, I can't be everywhere at once. It just does not work like that. When I was a, a young police officer, I'd only been on the job maybe a year or two, uh, but I still remember this. I was uh, downtown. I was walking. I was on foot. And a guy came up to me, a younger guy, probably in his mid-20s, and, uh, of course, I was in my mid-20s then, too. And he started complaining to me. And, and what I did not realize when I was a young police officer is what they issue you with your uniform is they issue you a sign that goes on the back that says complaint department. But you can't see it. Only irate citizens can see it. And uh, he saw my complaint department sign, and he com proceeded to complain to me how he, had, he lived out in the county under the sheriff's department's jurisdiction. And uh, one evening, the, uh, his dogs were barking, and, and there was, he looked out his windows, and there was three prowlers, three bad guys, three people out in his driveway. And he got on the phone, and he called the sheriff's department, dialed 911, told them, hey, this is where I live, and there's three guys out there. I said, okay. And he said, now, and he had, said he had two little kids and his wife, and he was very afraid. All right, I, I got you. I can, I can, I'm with you. Then he went on to tell me that before the sheriff's deputy could arrive, that the three men broke into an attached garage and how he had gathered his family in the back room and he was waiting and waiting for the sheriff's department to arrive. And before the sheriff's department got there, the men fled. So yay team, right? And they, they fled and the sheriff's department arrived. Well, he was angry because it took them over 15 minutes to get to his house. And then, well, he lived out in the county in the country. And uh, most rural areas have maybe one sheriff's deputy for every 50 square miles, 100 square miles. Depends where you live. If you live out west, there might be one sheriff's deputy for every 100 square miles on duty. And uh, I explained to him, I said, well, you know, there, at night where I lived at the time, I knew that, that there were you know, in the evening, there were two deputies on duty patrolling at one time, one in the eastern half of the county and one in the western half of the county. And if that deputy was in the middle of a traffic stop or something when he got the call, he's got to stop what he's doing and find his way to your house. Uh, they're, they're, they didn't have tr teleporters or freaking instant transportation. Well, I asked this gentleman what I thought, you know, and he went on to tell me how that wasn't right and he pays his taxes and yada, yada, and they should have been there faster and and they just don't care, and uh, and how scared he was, and he was in fear for his life and that for of his family. And so I asked him a what I thought was a logical question, and you guys have probably already, you smart fans have already thought it in your head. You're going to say, well, did you have a gun? 
you know, were, and I asked him that. I said, well, did you have a gun? Thinking that was a logical question. And I didn't live in New York City or New Jersey or Connecticut or some, you know, People's Republic. We lived in rural Ohio. And he looked at me and he said, I don't believe in guns. And I, I got to admit to you, ladies and gentlemen, I was floored. I thought, all right, so you're going to stand here complaining to me how you were in fear, how you were desperately in fear for the lives of your wife and your children, and you don't believe in guns. Well, as a young guy, young cop, I, I did, you know, I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry that that happened to you, and I was nice. What I was thinking in my head is, do you believe in having your wife raped and murdered in front of your very eyes, you moron? How do you how do you justify that in your brain? How do you think, well, it's not my responsibility to protect my family. I have a phone. And, uh, you know, I'll just use this phone to protect my family. Make sure you throw your phone at the three burglars when they smash in your door. Uh, or tell them how you don't believe in guns. Maybe that's what he could have done, Jared. Uh, he could have sat them down in his living room, had some coffee, he probably wouldn't have had a Black Hills coffee mug like me because he doesn't believe in guns. So I'm sure he doesn't believe in the ammunition that goes in them. Sit them down and explain to them how you don't believe in guns. And because you don't believe in guns, maybe they should just go ahead and find someone who does believe in guns. No, they're glad to find you. Believe me this, ladies and gentlemen, if you're a recidivist criminal, you don't want to run into a homeowner that believes in guns. Those are the people you want to avoid at all costs. You want to believe in or you want to run into my little friend here uh, who doesn't believe in guns, who believes that there's this magical 911 phone and uh, that you can just use that phone and it's going to save the world. Uh, and I remember, I, I don't know how old some of you guys are, but at one time in America, there was not a 911 system. Jared doesn't know it because he's a young puppy and there's been 911 ever since he's been alive. But it used to be you actually had to memorize or learn a seven digit phone number to call the police. I know you're thinking, what? Seven numbers? I can never remember seven numbers. <laughs> and some parts of the country, you might, still might have this where it was 777 2222 was your cop number or 777-3333 was the fire department number. But uh, in order to sell the 911 system to the nation, what did they have to do? Well, they had to pay for it, right? They had to pay for it and they had to convince you, the citizen, that it was worth that extra half a percent sales tax or 1% sales tax or whatever it was that levy that they were proposing. Because back in the old days, uh, when we actually had to go to the voters and ask them for permission to raise taxes, unlike today when we just don't even have a budget and we spend all kinds of money that we don't have. Back in the olden days, when you had to actually get permission from the citizen to raise their taxes. Can you imagine that, Jared? That, that the government actually had to seek the permission of the citizen to raise taxes? It's crazy talk. We shouldn't leave that up to the peasants. The peasants can't be trusted to do something like that. Well, what they had to do is they had to, they had to campaign for 911. They had to go out there and they had to, you know, they put up posters and they, you know, they did, you know, campaigns and radio ads and all that to convince you, the voter, to vote for Proposition 7 or um, Addendum 12 or whatever it was so that they could raise your sales tax or your property tax or whatever tax they were going to raise in order to install this new wonderful 911 system. Well, what did they have to sell you? Well, they had to sell you on the wonders of 911. How if you just give us this $100,000, we will install a 24 hour a day 911 emergency system. And whether you want a cop, whether you want an ambulance, you want a fireman, whatever you want, you want a pizza delivered, okay, not a pizza, but you want a cop, a fireman, you want a government servant to come to your house and rescue you. All you have to do is pick up your phone and punch in 911 and they'll be there. And that's what they did. They sold the nation on the wonders of the 911 program. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 911 is fine. I don't have anything against 911. But 
the world is the world. The world is made up of distance and time. You don't dial 911 and a EMT teleports to your front door. Sometimes people are busy. Sometimes they're not close to you. Think about it like this. If you live in a rural county like I lived in, and on a Friday night there's a domestic violence going on, there's a domestic dispute, wife and husband are tearing it up, breaking the windows out, and there's two sheriff's deputies on duty that night. Both of those sheriff's deputies are going to be there at that call. You call and say there's a burglar out back. Well, what are they going to do? Are they going to clone a deputy real quick and teleport him to your house? He just isn't there. Let's talk about, and you know, we talk uh, in Student of the Gun, not just about guns, but about, about actual independence and about taking care of yourself. And we do a class called Beyond the Band-Aid. And if you're laying by the side of the road and one of your arteries in your arm or your leg is open, that's a bad, bad day for you. If we don't stop that blood from pumping out, you're going to die. You're not going to die in 10 or 20 or 30 minutes. You're going to die in two or three minutes. We say, well, I dialed 911 and the ambulance will be here in five minutes. You got a three minute clock. It doesn't matter if the ambulance is going to be there in five minutes. If you continue to bleed out unabated for three minutes, you're going to expire. Well, yeah, but I've got my cell phone. Put your cell phone on the wound. Maybe it will heal it. People don't think about that anymore. We've been so 911. Uh, We've been taught that all I have to have is my cell phone. How, how many of you out there in the audience remember the story of the, of the hiker and his son who got lost out in one of the national parks? Uh, this has been several years. It might have even been a decade ago. But I, I recall they had this guy. He survived. They found him. And, uh, and they had him on one of the morning shows, you know, I don't know, Oprah or something. And they were talking to him. And they found his phone. And he had like 47 911 dial-out attempts that didn't get out. Well, when he left home to go hiking through the woods, his survival kit was a cell phone. Bad choice. Just saying. How did we get, as a nation, how did we get to this point where we believe that a cell phone is somehow a personal defense tool, a medical kit, a fire extinguisher, it's everything. I wish my phone could put out fires and stop bleeding and, and uh, shoot bad guys when they come through my front door, but unfortunately, I don't think they've invented that phone yet. Apple might be working on it. I'm not sure. I'll have to check on that and get back with you guys later. A phone is just a tool, ladies and gentlemen, and if you aren't prepared to take care of yourself in that first five minutes, then it's probably not going to get done. The police will just come and find your body. It, it's... <laughs> It's like the uh, on campuses where they have these uh, pole stations. You know, they they have the uh, the pole the blue the blue lights and the pole stations. And if you if you feel threatened or you're about to be raped or something, you're supposed to run over to one and pull it. Well, does a, a police officer magically appear out of the little pole there with the blue light on it? No, that just tells them where to come and find your body. And uh, just recently, I saw there's a new cell phone app. That there is like never walk alone or never be alone or something. And it tracks you. And if you need help, you just tap the red button on your phone and it'll transmit your location to the nearest emergency services agency. Well, if you just got jumped by a bad guy and uh, your 19 year old daughter is about to get raped and she taps the phone, the phone app, um, what is that exactly is that going to do? Well, that, that'll tell the police where to arrive, where to find her phone or her body after she's been raped in 5, 10, 15 minutes. Folks, it's lunacy. And yet there are people out there that are trying to convince you that you're not smart enough. You're not responsible enough. You're not intelligent enough to defend yourself. You need to just abdicate all that to one centralized government body. Just be a good little peasant and let us take care of the heavy lifting. Because it's it's disgusting. The things that are going on in Colorado, was it the University of Colorado, Jared, where they came out and they're like, uh, women, women are not uh, emotionally mature enough 
to use guns to defend themselves. How insulting is that? <laughs> if you're a woman listening right now, you're probably shaking your fist at, at your at your iPad or whatever you're listening on or iPhone. <laughs> but yeah, they uh, and uh, these are the this is the party of compassion and the party that that respects women. The Democrat Party that respects women will also tell you that you're not emotionally mature enough to defend yourself with a firearm. You should just pee on yourself and the rapist will stop. That that's your that's your rape defense right there. Blow a whistle. That's your rape defense. Or push a little button on your on your cell phone. Push a little red button and they'll know where to come and find your body later. And we laugh at it because it's ridiculous. But there are people out there in the world that actually think that that's a good idea, that that's practical and that's reasonable. Because, you know, you peasants, you can't, you can't be allowed arms to defend yourself. You just, you're just not smart enough. We need to leave it to people like Joe Biden to defend us because he's obviously that much smarter than we are. Now, uh, keeping up with uh, what's going on in the world, uh, last week when we spoke, we talked about uh, our friend in New Jersey – who got a visit from the Child Services Gestapo uh, because they were afraid that there were children that had access to guns in his home, and that was dangerous. I got news for you, folks. My children have always had access to guns. <gasps> what? My children are now grown, and they are responsible adults. And you know how they became responsible adults? You don't become responsible adults when they turn 18 and you wave a magic wand over their head. They become responsible adults because you train them and you bring them up correctly. That's how they become responsible adults. But apparently in New Jersey, they haven't yet figured that out. So they sent the Gestapo to this guy's house on a Friday night to bang on his door without a warrant and demand entry. Well, Governor Chris Christie, who... I, I'm sorry, Chris Christie just n does not give me a warm fuzzy. He seems to be like most typical politicians. Uh, when it's convenient, he's a conservative. And then when things get tough, he just kind of steps away. Well, apparently enough pressure was put on the governor this week over this his uh, child services Gestapo that he stepped in and he's asking the attorney general, we're going to ask the government to investigate the government. And that, does that make you feel good? You're like, whew. oh, the uh, attorney general is going to they're going to probe. I like that. They're going to probe to see if the visit by the child enforcement agency or child services agency with uh, four police officers in tow, if they overstepped their bounds or if they violated any of their policies or rules by doing that. OK, well, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I don't know. What do you what do you think is going to come of that? Do you think this is Chris Christie just covering his butt and trying to pretend like he's some kind of a pseudo conservative when the child services people are terminated, fired, jailed, fined when that happens? And I know it happened for real. Then I'll believe it until then. Sorry, not buying it. Uh, what happens when when government agents abuse citizens? People, the people get mad, the citizens get angry about it, and the, uh, they come out and they're like, oh, we're, we're going to take care of them. They transfer them to a different department, they put a letter in their file, and they just go right on consuming your good tax money. So if and when Governor Christie actually disciplines this agency, I'll believe it. Un until then, I'm just going to go ahead and be a doubting Thomas. Now, we talked a little bit about Student of the Gun uh, and you following us on Facebook and Twitter. I want to make sure that everybody out there in the sound of my voice is aware of studentofthegun.com. And what we've done for you, what we do for you every week is we put up a video material. We put up our shows. We have the radio uh, podcast up there. You can listen to that. And I also have articles every week. And if you go to studentofthegun.com right now, you look on the home page, you'll see that there's a little sign up on the right there. You sign up for our newsletter and we're not going to spam you. We're not going to sell it. But what we will do is we're going to offer you uh, special deals. Right now we have a free training. If you, if you sign up, you actually get a free training video and we give you special deals on training because we believe 
that you're a beginner once, but you should be a student for life. And part of being a student for life is continuously educating yourself, whether it's from us or whether it's from someone else. You shouldn't, you know, a lot of folks say, well, when they, when they get by a gun, I said, you could take training. Yeah, I took a class. Well, when was it? Well, 10 years ago or five years ago or eight years ago, you took one class. Yeah. Folks, one class is just the beginning. One class, you're going to get one person's opinion. I don't want you to just take my opinion. I want you to take the opinions of 20 other people. That is how you develop. That is how you grow as a well-rounded human being. You didn't just have one instructor or one teacher when you were growing up, did you? Can you imagine like K through 12 having only one individual teacher and that was it? Well, of course not. You had teachers that you liked. You had teachers that you didn't like. You had teachers that you didn't like until you became an adult and you were able to digest that information and think, hmm, I guess Mr. Porter was pretty, he was a pretty smart guy. I, maybe he actually knew what he was talking about. <laughs> That's part of the maturity process. And so what we want you to do is we don't want you to just take one class. We want you to educate yourself all the time. Now, I understand that, you know, you can't always go to training classes, though you should at some point in time take your butt and your body to a f- actual professional training school and get some training. But how do we uh, how do we work around that, or how do we work when we're not at schools? Well, we read. Actually, read a book. And if you follow Student of the Gun Homeroom, uh, our homeroom feature, we have recommended reading every week. Uh, a lot of good books out there. Uh, watch DVDs. DVDs are not training. DVDs assist you or they give you additional information uh, for training. They give you additional ideas. You might watch a DVD uh, and you think, man. I never even thought about that until he mentioned it. Great. Congratulations. That's part of the student of the gun learning process. And that's where you want to be. Now, we don't want you want you to not forget about student of the week. Go to our Facebook page. Go to student of the gun at Facebook. Post your comments. Post your questions. If we read your question on the air, then we will send you a free student of the gun T-shirt just because we like you. Well, if you're listening to this show, you probably know that it's a part of the Firearms Radio Network, and there are lots of different shows on the network. And uh, Jake Challen, our producer, has has invited me as a guest speaker on some of the shows I've been on, uh, Gun Guy Radio, and most recently I was on This Week in Guns. We recorded that show here uh, actually uh, just uh, yesterday as I record this one. But uh, a question came up during the show. One of the uh, listeners had written in. And he was looking for some advice or, uh, I guess, probably some affirmation. And he said that uh, he had just recently applied for his concealed carry license or his concealed carry permit. And he had been in a store, and uh, I believe it was Dick's Sporting Goods, and a guy had come in and freaked out. He threatened the uh, the gun shop clerk with a gun, took a 12-gauge, and walked around the store menacing people and finally barricaded himself in the back room and shot himself. Uh, that's That was the details or the loose details that I got. It doesn't really matter, the specifics. And But the guy's question was, well, I was in the store the day before or the week before or what have you with my four-year-old son, and what should I have done? Or it made me think, you know, what should I do or what would I do? And what do you guys think? Well, first of all, you need to realize that you can what if every situation to death. And a lot of people fall into this this mental trap of when they get a concealed carry permit and that their gunfight will go down like this. They 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 have this mental picture, this mental image of if they're ever accosted, if they're ever uh, you know attempted robbery, or if they're ever in a restaurant and a bad guy comes in, that this is how it's going to go down, and this is how it's going to act. They're going to you know whip out their Roscoe and they're going to shoot the bad guy one time, and he's going to flip backwards and expire, and the police are going to come in, they're going to shake his hand and tell him what a great guy he is, and everything's going to be wonderful. Uh, well, obviously that's not the case. And, and sadly, the truth is, is you're probably going to be, uh, a su- you will be a suspect for at least a short amount of time because when the police arrive, all they know is there was gunshots. There are people there with guns. We don't know who was doing the shooting or why was the shooting occurred. So we need to figure it out. And until they figure everything out, you're just a guy with a gun. And as far as they know, you're a criminal or a murderer. So you need to understand that. But Part, part of the, the danger of, of going to specific, you know, into specifics like that is you say, well, 
this is what you should have done. Or if a person says, well, if it would have been me, I would have done this and this and this. And it's a, <laughs> it, it's a slippery slope. Or when you say, you know, absolutes like that, you say, well, what if? What if I was standing here? What if the guy would have done this? And one of the big questions this guy asks is, you know, would I have been justified uh, in shooting this guy? Or should I have shot, you know, if I would have had my gun, should I have shot him? Or should I have done something else? And I, I can't tell you that. I, I really can't. Uh, what I can tell you is this. And one of the other panel members said, well, you know, your your uh, your first responsibility is to your four-year-old child or your children or your wife. And I said, and I, I absolutely agree with them. And, but what a lot of people say is, well, my first responsibility is to my children or my wife. And what I'm going to do is if I see a bad guy with a gun or a situation materializes, I will herd them or move them or whatever into to safety. I'll, I'll grab them and run to safety. Brother, you can't outrun a bullet in case you're wondering. And you, you have to ask yourself this, why am I carrying a gun? That's the question. Why am I carrying a gun? Is it because you're using it as a penis extension? Uh, if you're, and, and if that's, if that's the case, okay, drive on. You're just, you know, using it to uh, make up for some type of shortcoming. I got you. And there are people out there like that, but be honest with yourself. Look yourself in the mirror and say, and say, you know, why am I doing it? Because I think my buddies will think I'm cool because I have a gun on, or I like to go into my favorite gun shop and pull my jacket open and show them my, you know, stainless steel 45. Or are you carrying a gun because you understand that a firearm is the most effective tool to stop felons and bad people who want to hurt you and hurt your family? We don't carry guns as penis extensions. We don't carry guns because we want to impress our friends, or you shouldn't. That's not the purpose. The purpose of carrying a handgun is because it is a convenient self-defense tool. It's not the most effective self-defense tool on the planet, but it is the most convenient one to carry. We already talked about that. You can't walk into Walmart with an 870 shotgun over your shoulder because people get excited. But you can walk in with a Glock 19 underneath a sweatshirt and no one is the wiser and you just go about your business. And the gun doesn't materialize until it is actually needed. Now, it, you need to be honest with yourself. If you, if you believe that you could never actually shoot a human being in your heart of hearts, you just, I just can never do it. I could never put a bullet into a homo sapien. Now, don't don't fool yourself into thinking that that person across the aisle with the with the razor blade or the the straight razor or the freaking pistol or the shotgun is a wonderful human being who's just simply misunderstood. That's generally not the case. They're not wonderful human beings that are simply misunderstood. Most of them are recidivist criminals that have been a scumbag since they were age 11. But I digress. If you if you believe that you could never actually shoot someone, don't carry a gun. Just don't do it. Uh, we don't use guns to bluff bad guys. We don't use them uh, as threatening tools. If you don't believe that you could press the trigger, then don't carry it. But if you are carrying it, you need to understand that there may come a time when that is what you need to do, and you need to be prepared to do it. And they say, well, that's wonderful for you to say, Paul, because you know, you've been there and you've carried a gun. Well, how do we learn? And I hate to be a broken record, but how do you learn to deal with situations like that? Do you just make it up on the spot? Well, hopefully before you've gotten to that point in your life or you've gotten to that situation, you've gone through some several uh, if-then situations. Old computer programs know that, you know, if-then, go-to. And uh, if this happens, then I will do this. How do you do that? Well, you do that originally under the guidance of, of a qualified instructor. You go through training. You go through practical training. Now, there's marksmanship training, which is fantastic. You need marksmanship because that's the fundamental upon which you build. But if you're carrying a gun because you want to protect your life with it, you need to go through situational training, and you need to go through training where they actually require you or encourage you to think, problem solve, and make decisions all while using a gun. That is where you become effective. That's where you actually can use that tool as it's designed to. 
Uh, I, I wish I could tell you, you could say, hey, if this situation occurs, do this. If this one occurs, do that. But that's not the way the world is. And you don't get to call the tune. I was talking to a colleague of mine uh, just this week, and uh, a, a good friend of ours was murdered. And unfortunately, our friend, who was a gun guy, who was a pro-Second Amendment guy, was he was unarmed. And, and my friend and I we were just kind of taken back. And, and, uh, and he said to me, he said, you know, that just really – drives it home for me that uh, you don't get to call it. You don't get to decide when the bad guy shows up that we don't carry guns because we're planning to use them unless you're a bad guy. We're, we carry them because we don't know. You don't know when you may be called upon to use it. It's like a fire extinguisher or a first aid kit. We don't carry fire extinguishers because we're looking for fires. We have them because we know one might happen and we need to deal with it. And that's why we carry guns, because you don't know what tomorrow may bring. You might listen to that. You might be in the gym on the treadmill right now. And if you are, do five more minutes. I want you to do five more minutes for me. All right. You might be in the gym on the treadmill. You get off, go take a shower, get dressed, walk out to the parking lot, and some crackhead is busting into your car. And turns on you with a razor. You did. Are you ready to deal with that? Or did you think, well, I'm just going to the gym. I don't need to take my gun with me. I'm just going to the grocery store. I'm just going to run up to the, uh, to the gas station. I don't need it. Brother, you don't get to make that decision. That decision is made for you. And if you're not prepared to deal with it, that's just going to be your tough luck. So we need you need you need to ask yourself: Are you uh, my good friend, Sheriff Jim Wilson? He uh, coined a phrase, or he uses a phrase a lot. I don't know if he came up with it, but he calls it playing at self defense. And essentially, it's this: it's those guys that talk themselves out of carrying, uh, or that only carry when they know they're going to get an opportunity to show their friends their new shiny, their shiny new 1911 or whatever it is. Uh, those you're. That's playing at self-defense. That's not serious about it. If you carry a gun only when you, quote, unquote, think you're going to need it, uh, I, I don't even understand what that means. I mean, if you think you're going to need it, A, why are you going there? And B, why are you taking a handgun? Uh, that's playing at self-defense. Uh, changing holsters every week. Changing carry positions on your body. One week, one day I use it a, a, a front you know, uh, in appendix carry, then a waistband carry, then a pocket carry, then an ankle carry, then a dude, you're, you're never going to, if you do that, you're never going to know where your gun is. You're just playing at self-defense. Don't play at self-defense. Take it seriously. It's your life. It's the life of your children, the life of your family, the life of your spouse. That's whose lives you're protecting. So be honest with yourself. Say, am I playing at self-defense or am I really serious about it? And if I'm serious about it, how do I need to do that? And uh, I, I don't want to bring you down, but it's a serious world we live in, and it's time to make some serious decisions. We're adults here. We're not children. We're not kindergartners. We're adults, and adults have to make tough decisions, and that's what it's all about. Now, our uh, our friends at uh, Keltec, we told you last week that they're making guns as fast as they can. Uh, if you're really into shotguns, you want to check out the Keltec KSG, and you're like, Paul, I did, and they told me it was going to be a year. Okay, get on the waiting list. It's worth it. Uh, and I've also had people say, well, I don't like the KSG for this reason or that reason. Okay, fantastic. But what you need to understand is, is when they designed that gun, they did something that no one else had ever done. They took a chance, and that's something that Keltec has always done. Now, every gun they've designed has it been a hit? No, maybe not. Not every one. But the thing is, they're doing things differently. They're taking chances. They're breaking the comfort zone, and they're stepping outside of the box. That is how we grow and develop. Can you imagine if we didn't do that? We'd still be shooting flintlock brown best muskets, right? And someone said, "Hey, we don't need to do this anymore." Let's do it a different way. Well, that's what Keltec is doing. And whether you like Keltec products, whether you like the KSG or the RFP, it it's not really it doesn't really matter whether you like it or not. The fact is, is they're doing something different. They're doing something unique, and that's you know that inspires other manufacturers. Like, hmm, well, if Keltec can do that, I bet we can do it too. 
Uh, and that that is really the importance of it. Now, our friends at Crossbreed, we talked last week, uh, we talked about um, – our uh, different holster selections, the Super Tuck, and the, it actually is my favorite in the waistband holster right now. They have a really cool uh, product that goes by your bed, and it w- works in with your mattress. Now, I want to make sure that I use the correct terminology because there's two different types of terminologies. There's a – yeah, <laughs> it's called the bedside backup. Now, the bedside backup is a, is a ridiculously simple design that's infinitely practical. It the uh, basically it's two pieces and you have a holster. It slides in between your box spring and your mattress. So, and if you have a crossbreed holster or any kind of a holster, for that matter, and you wear a gun from the time you put your pants on to the time you take them off at night, well, what do you do with that gun when you take it off at night? Some people, well, I put it in the closet. I put it here. I put it there. I put it on the nightstand. Well, why not slip it into a holster that's attached to your bed? Uh, I've got a G19 on my body right now. If my G19 that's not is not on my body, it's in the bedside backup, and I'm probably laying within two feet of it. And then I get up out of the bed, I pull it out of the backup, I put it in the holster on my body, and I drive on. So it's always one of two places. It's either where I can reach it from my bed or where I can reach it from, with my right hand. And that's just the way it is. And, and uh, we, we, I was talking to a good buddy of mine this week, and we were talking about having kids, you know, in your home. And he said, well, you know, if no, for no other reason, I carry my gun because that gives me control of it. Think about that, folks. If the gun is attached to your body, you know where it is, and you have control of the gun. If you put it on shelves or on bed stand, nightstands, if you stash it here, stash it there, and you're constantly playing the I'm going to stash my gun here game, you're not in control of that gun. And if you've got kids, the best way to control your gun is to actually put it on your body and have it attached to you. Oh, it's it's not really all that complicated. And stop talking yourself out of wearing your gun. Quit making excuses for yourself and just do it. And one of the excuses people make is, oh, I tried this holster and I just uh, I, I didn't work. I couldn't wear the gun. You know, it, it it bothered me. It was always digging in my side. I always I always felt like it, I knew it was there. Well. If you're a new gun owner, or even if you're an old gun, if you're an old gun owner, you probably have a Rubbermaid tub full of holsters, <laughs> and that's something that we do as gun carriers is we go through holsters. Now holsters do wear out eventually, and they need to be replaced. But most guys have a tub full of holsters because it seemed like a great idea at the time. They read the ad in the magazine, they bought the holster, they tried it, it didn't work. They threw it in the tub and they bought a new one, and so now they have. And used holsters are worth about what, Jared? They're good for dog toys, and you give them to your friends. But other than that, <laughs> you're not going to get a whole lot of money out of a used holster. It just doesn't work like that unless maybe it's a, a tricked-out cowboy rig or something or it used to belong to John Wayne. But uh, and, and but that's part of the great thing about being an American is you actually have lots and lots of choices. Uh, and I would rather have the choices than not have them. But uh, if you're going to carry a gun, carry it. Quit talking yourself out of it. Anything else we want to talk about this week, Jared? He's giving me the look. He's like, oh, I don't know, Dad. Um, oh, I just let her secret out. Yes, Jared is my oldest son. He's uh, Crossbreed Holsters, we thank them. We thank Caltech Farms. We thank Firearms Radio Network for bringing us on board, for being, us, being our bandwidth sponsor. And we want to remind you guys that if you're a student of the gun, you're a beginner once, but you should be a student for life.